Welcome to Woman on Her Path. Every woman has her own unique path. But what does that mean? How does said woman know what her path is? How does she find the courage to follow her path? I am your host, Tiffany Cooper. I am a mother, energy worker, community herbalist, and bhakti yogi. By sharing my experiences and insights on my path, I hope to inspire and encourage you on yours. When we follow our path, we find the answers we need in life. Let's find answers together and create a better world for ourselves and those around us. So hello, gorgeous woman. Today, we are so fortunate to have a lovely guest with us on Woman on Her Path. Today, we have authoress and certified yoga therapist, Deborah Charns. Deborah is here to tell us about her inspiring new book, From the Boxing Ring to the Ashram. So first of all, I want to say thank you, Deborah, for joining us today and be, being willing to share some of the wisdom you have acquired and written about in your book. And I am also so very happy to have you on the show. So thank well, you. Thank you, because it truly is one of my desires to share the wisdom of not my wisdom, because I don't think I have that much wisdom. <laughs> so I look at my book as being a compilation of the wisdom from 12 of my gurus around the world. They live on four continents. And when I first had the idea of writing a book, you know, I kind of thought, well, who am I to write a book? <laughs> and of course, I wanted to share teachings of people who I highly respect. And I really wanted to make a difference in people's lives so that people can be happier and healthier. Because I truly do believe that it is attainable and it can be easier than what most people think. Well, your book actually spells it all out in such a beautiful way. And I love the format of it. Um, but before we get into that, can you please just tell us a bit about yourself and your background in holistic health? Sure. I was raised in a diabetic household and I had digestive disorders and chronic back pain from the time I was an adolescent. And, you know, so much of things we just take for granted. So if I had digestive disorders all my life, I just assumed that that was normal. That was me. But as far as the back pain, I fortunately had an orthopedic surgeon who told me that I needed to do different physical exercises to strengthen my core and to reshape my spine. Mm -hmm. So from a very young age, I would guess I was maybe 13 years old. So the concept of making a difference in your body and preventing pain came to me when I was very young through a highly regarded medical professional. I am so thankful that I had those problems as a child, because if it wasn't for that, maybe I would have gone on the traditional path thinking you have to pop a pill or go to the operating room for most problems. And the same thing with my digestive disorders. I recognized early on, again, I saw a gastroenterologist and I learned that my digestive disorders, like so many other people with any physical issues, they were all stress related. You know, when I was just a kid, I didn't think that I had stress. 
And hey, that's just, I recognize now that that is how my body responds to the slightest bit of stress. So I, so I, early on, I was very focused on health. My mother, because she was a diabetic, I remember, you know, she used to make her own what she called cookies, and I loved them, but it was more almost like doggy biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> they were so high in fiber, and of course, there was zero sugar content, but that's what I ate as cookies, and that's what I make now. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Cookies and desserts. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. It's really interesting that you were able to start that journey young in your life. You learned very early. Um, I've had similar experience as well as having some health issues as a child, which led to me still to this very day of practicing certain things to make sure that I do not have a lot of stress in my life. So I really appreciate that and can relate. Yes. And those cookies, that's so <laughs> wonderful that you are still um, making those cookies and eating them because clearly they were nutritious and um, come from a place of being healthy in terms of what your mother was eating and sharing with you. The other thing I want to add is my entire life, I felt I was overweight my daughter has helped me to recognize that some of it was, I might get the name wrong, is it body dysmorphia or something like that? Yeah. But I was always like the largest, biggest in my class and in the workplace. I was always the biggest and the largest. I was never a thin kid. I was always big and bulky and, <laughs> and had excess weight. And so as a result of that too, I was always very conscientious about empty calories. You know, back in the day, I used to drink tab. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't drank, I haven't had any soda for, I don't know, 25 years now. But back then it was like, okay, I'll drink tab, 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 zero calories. Of course, now I view it as total poison. Is tab still on the market? I don't, I don't I think so. Yeah, I was gonna say I remember it being pretty, pretty intense as a soda. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for adding that as well because I think that's also another issue for Americans that affects our health very deeply, and people don't seem to realize it. Um, we are a nation of soda drinkers, and people don't really realize how much sugar they're consuming and you know, other chemicals when they're drinking a soda. The other thing too is, you know, unfortunately, 70% of Americans are overweight. Mm. Statistics are shocking. And then at the same time, often women like myself, and again, I was overweight. I'm not saying I wasn't, I was overweight. But, but even once I got my weight under control, I still saw myself as the fat girl, you know, <laughs> or I still saw all the, you know, I've never been petite. And so I always saw that I was not that model person. And in fact, I write in my book about when I decided to become a yoga teacher. And I was at an ashram in California. And one of the people living at the ashram asked me if I was planning on doing the yoga teacher training. And I was kind of like floored. I was over 50 years old. I was definitely overweight. I didn't look like your traditional yoga teacher. And again, we women too often are concerned about our body types mm -hmm. and about what other people view us as. And again, sometimes we have incorrect views of ourselves or unhealthy views of ourselves. Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely an issue as as a yoga instructor myself. I come across um, women who come to class 
wanting to, their focus is on the body. They want to tone the body or lose weight. Um, they're uncomfortable because they're comparing themselves to the yogi on the mat next to them. So all of those things come into play. And that's one of the things that I love about a yoga class as is it is a equalizer, so to speak. You know, we, you know, present a space that is safe and judgment free. It's ahimsa, you know, nonviolent. And so it really provides this container to hold all of the beautiful spirits who walk into the room without making people feel judged or feel um, as if they're the wrong, in quotation marks, body type. So yes, thank you for bringing that up. And what you're talking about is some of the wonderful issues that you address in this gorgeous book. I have been checking out each chapter of the book, and I'm so excited to talk more about it. So first of all, what made you choose the title From the Boxing Ring to the Ashram? What does that mean to you? What it means to me is transformation. And it also, to me, means overcoming challenges and obstacles getting up when you are knocked down. And of course, I don't necessarily mean physically knocked down. It also, to me, represents the two ends of the spectrum. The boxing ring, to me, implies violent nature or violence in human beings, punching one another, and as you well know, the ashram signifies ahimsa, which is to me the number one commandment. I call it a commandment or a tenet in yoga, which is nonviolence or do no harm. And that ahimsa is do no harm to other human beings, to other living entities, to the planet and to yourself. And I often think that one of the hardest things is the ahimsa for the self, because so often we, especially women, are focused on taking care of the kids, taking care of the parents, taking care of the neighbors, taking care of your coworkers, keeping your boss happy. And we don't take time to take care of ourselves. And that is why for many years, I have, I have many different signature workshops that I lead. And one of my favorites is called First Love Yourself. Mm -hmm. And I will be leading two of them in the next month. And even though I created that a long time ago, I found a lot of my signature workshops tie into my book, even though I created them before. <laughs> <laughs> and I find that the first Love Yourself workshop that I created ties into a chapter that features, features a guru who is based, he's an American guru living in India. His name is Radhana Swami. And I actually saw him this weekend in Dallas. And the title oh, of that chapter is Happiness Isn't a Big Bank Account. And although that is the title of the chapter, the essence of everything I wanted to relay, and I have heard him speak many times, I have read many of his books, but the essence that I wanted to relay in the chapter from him is that the most important thing in life is love. Mm -hmm. Whether it's love of self, love of your loved ones, love for a higher spirit, for the creator, love for the universe. Love is the highest and the best and the most important thing. And nothing else really matters. Exactly, exactly. Thank you so much for sharing that because this is something that I often talk about on this podcast is women having compassion for themselves 
because we cannot give from an empty well if we're not receiving love or having compassion and love for ourselves. And we certainly will run out of the energy needed to give love and show compassion to, to others. And thank you for bringing up Radhanath Maharaj because he is such an inspirational teacher. Just like you, I've read his books and have attended classes and watched videos. And everything that he has to say comes from his heart. I mean, I've met very few human beings who are as humble and genuine as he is. And he is such a wonderful example of a teacher within the bhakti tradition. So yes, thank you for invoking his name <laughs> in our space that we've created here today. I truly appreciate that. And not just Radhanath Swami, I mean, I really appreciate how in the book you share wisdom from your teachers throughout your life. And each chapter has such practical tips on how to practice, how each of your teachers practices what they're preaching. So how did you meet all of these illustrious gurus? I've had wanderlust all my life. When I was a kid, we used to go on road trips. My I was raised in Chicago and my grandparents lived in Tucson and then they lived in San Diego. So we would take the car and the five of us would pack up in the car and drive all the way out there. So I was used to these road trips. And of course, that was before you could pay for airline tickets because the cost of a ticket was so expensive back then. And once the cost of airfare became inexpensive, I was like, oh my God, I've got to travel everywhere. <laughs> I at one point would take weekend trips from Chicago to Mexico and I would buy woven merchandise and then sell them in Chicago to, to pay for my trip. So I've always had a little bit of that backpacker instinct. And even though I'm 65 years old, I still am, am like that. I travel like a backpacker and I stay in hostels, you know, with the guys and the, the males and females in the same dorm, you know, could have 20 people in a dorm and hey, you know, I do that because it's a great way to stretch the dollar and to be able to travel a lot. That said, I love traveling. And one of the gurus, I call them all my gurus, but they are people who have influenced me. One of them I met back in the 1980s when I was living in South America. Another one I met around 2010 in Mexico. Three of them I can think of that I met in India, another in California, two in California. So basically throughout my travels, I think I have always been a searcher. I am an Aquarian and I do believe that Aquarians are have a, inquisitive minds and they are adventuresome. And I think I fit that profile. Plus, I have a background in journalism. And so as a journalist, it's all about asking questions. <laughs> and we, we always want to know more. And I worked most of my adult life in public relations. And what I was taught, of my first job was we need to know the client's business better than they know their business. And we would have, I sometimes would have a dozen clients. So I would have to know about a dozen different businesses. But I loved that. I loved to always be learning about other things. And of course, I was always seeking how to find the optimal health and happiness. And so those people that sparked their wisdom, they stayed with me, even if the one from the 1980s, I haven't seen him since the 1980s, but I remember him so clearly. Mm, yes, a true guru, their, their message is timeless, their teachings are timeless. 
I love that. I think I mentioned to you before that your book reminds me of the 11th canto of the ancient text, the Srimad Bhagavatam, because in the 11th canto, it talks about the 24 gurus. And they often, um, they were things like the earth, air, water. Um, at one point, I think it even speaks about fire and the moon, a pigeon, you know, all of these different things within nature itself and all of the lessons that were learned um, from those different gurus. So it's lovely to think of, you know, that we are actually surrounded by gurus from many different places, different walks of life, different backgrounds. And clearly you have, you know, embodied that concept because you've pulled together so many beautiful lessons from so many different people. And I really appreciate that about your book. I have to say, though, I'm kind of jumping to the end of the book, but I have to say that my favorite of your gurus is your mother. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, she sounds so amazing. And I can totally connect to the energy that you describe around her and within her, you know. And, oh, and I also have to point out that my grandmother also loved to wear sky blue. So <laughs> I felt so connected when I was reading that part of your book. <laughs> so I talk about my book as being life lessons from a dozen gurus, but I consider my mother in the book, I call her my 13th guru, but of course she was my first guru. She was mm -hmm. not my 13th. And, <laughs> you know, I, I think like many young people, I was rebellious in my own ways. I wanted to be individualistic and I didn't want to follow the path that my parents wanted me to follow. And I saw myself as being so different from my mother and so different from my father. And now, oh my God, I'm just like my mom. <laughs> <laughs> I can totally relate to that. <laughs> That's so wonderful because again, the way you describe her in the book, I was I was reading and thinking, oh my God, I love her energy and I can so connect. And she's she's actually so amazing. So yeah, yeah, it's wonderful to um come full circle and see yourself embody all of those beautiful qualities that she had. Well, the thing about my mother is it was very obvious when I gave homage to her in the book that I expressed that I learned about writing through her because she was a writer. So she was my first writing teacher. So that was obvious. But other things that I learned from her were patience and persistence. Mm. Because, and that actually was beneficial for me during my entire public relations career. For those of you who are not familiar with how public relations or media relations in particular works, we can reach out to hundreds of people and get no response. And my mother would send her articles to hundreds of outlets and get rejection letter after rejection letter. So I learned from her that all you need is just that one. But even more important than those aspects that my mother passed on to me was the moral compass. My mother was a social activist in her day, even though she didn't even know how to drive a car. <laughs> and even though she didn't know how to balance a checkbook, <laughs> but she was, she took me when I was a kid, you know, she would take me to demonstrations and, you know, we would pick it. So I learned that I, it was my responsibility to speak out on behalf of the less fortunate and to try to make this world a better place for all and that is also you know that is of course one of the missions that I had in the book however I can do that I want to help people that's such a beautiful um 
you know, duty. It's to take on that that type of service attitude in your life. Now you're bringing me to another question, which is from your perspective, what are the biggest concerns that are plaguing society today? Oh, <laughs> there are so many. What I like to say is that as society advances, mm-hmm. we are going backwards so, so quickly. that way. And it hurts me so much. And one of the things that hurts me so much is ahimsa for the planet. Mm. Our planet is being destroyed. And every time I go to the grocery store, it kills me when I see people taking those plastic bags. Mm. I just don't get it. I spend a lot of time in other countries. One of them is Costa Rica. Costa Rica banned single-use bags a long time ago. Long time ago. That's right. They sure did. (laughs) And and I, you know, there are just so many things that I don't understand about our culture that we do things for convenience, but we don't look beyond that convenience. We don't look at what we are doing. It's the same concept as eating a chicken McNugget. A child doesn't realize that it comes from a little chick that's so cute and fluffy. The same thing when we throw out our garbage, we don't consider where is this going to? Mm -hmm. And that is something that, you know, just kills me. Um, But on a health and wellness standpoint, because I, of course, have worked in this field for a long time, and I am a certified yoga therapist, and I do a lot with nutritional consulting and just with all sorts of things. And from a health and wellness perspective, we talk all the time about SAD, the standard American diet. And I admit when I was younger, I didn't always eat healthy. But, you know, when I see people, let's just say, I'm just going to kind of make this up, but having lunch is a can of soda and a donut and who knows what else, where it's just all sugar, all calories, no nutrients, nothing fresh, that hurts me so much. And again, if we look at how our ancestors lived, everything was fresh and meals were cooked with love. Even if they were meager, they were fresh and cooked with love. You know, I worked in the marketing industry for far too long and I represented consumer products all the time. And I represented the fast food industry. I represented alcoholic beverages. And I didn't, I didn't support any of those. So from a very early age, I didn't, I was not aligned with them. And yet I was promoting them for work. And it bothers me to no end that our diet is so poor. And as a result of it, our health care in the United States in particular is horrendous. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're also reminding me of the chapter in your book about Chaitanya Charan and mindful eating and just how important it is to be mindful, to really think about what we're eating and how we're eating it. In fact, just yesterday, I was teaching a yoga class and a student was telling me that the Lone Star Tick has been found in our area. And apparently, a bite from this tick essentially makes one allergic to red meat. (laughs) (laughs) And when he told me that, the first thing that went through my mind was, Wow, I love (laughs) how that works. I love how the planet, how Krishna, how God, however you see God, makes it so that things kind of self-correct themselves or, you know, the um, the planet and, and life just all works together 
to make the corrections that need to be made. So <laughs> I just thought that was so interesting when he told me that. And I thought about, I actually thought about your book and, and what um, Chaitanya Charan had written or what you had written about Chaitanya Charan. So. The thing about mindful eating is, and again, this is something that has always bothered me, is that eating becomes a habit. We are not feeding because ourselves because we are hungry. We are not giving ourselves necessarily the proper nutrients. We eat because, oh, we see the donut store and we want to pop in and get some, or it's 12 o'clock. And so we think we should eat. Now that said, from an Ayurvedic standpoint, and one of the chapters in my book is all about Ayurveda, from an Ayurvedic standpoint, it is very important to eat at certain times of the day. From an Ayurvedic standpoint, however, it is also very important to fast periodically. It's like a cleansing or a reset of our digestive system. And among the other signature workshops that I lead, I do one which is on digestive disorders and then a separate one which is on weight management and a third one that is on blood sugar management. Oh, fantastic. And for all of them, I do talk about mindful eating. You know, I think about when you, I don't go to the movies anymore, but you know, typically, you know, when I went to the movies, I would always buy a big, huge thing of popcorn. I never, ever put the butter on it. But I would eat a huge thing of popcorn. And again, it's mindless eating. You are acculturized to believe that when you go to the movies, you are supposed to eat popcorn. Well, working in the marketing world, I also know that we lead people to believe that when you watch sports on television or in person, you are supposed to drink a beer. <laughs> yep. I mean, these are just crazy things that we are teaching people. And there is a disconnect between what our body needs and wants and what we think is right. And something that I did want to mention, because you were talking about Chaitanya Charan, that chapter, and also you were talking before about can't remember what it was, but but the concept that came to my mind was something that, oh, about body and how, how some people come to yoga to sculpt their body. And one thing that Chaitanya Charan talks about, he is based out of India, but he spends a lot of time traveling and he is very in, in tune to modern Western culture. And he said he was rather shocked when he found out that in the United States, the yoga teachers in particular, most of them ate meat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because in India, of course, the culture of, of not eating any meat or eggs mm -hmm. is very common. And especially among any one that is on a yogic path or a spiritual path. And of course, there are so many yogic paths or spiritual paths, but for the most part, they all in include no drinking of alcoholic beverages, right? Exactly. No consuming of meat or eggs. Exactly. And so he was just surprised that that does not carry through to the United States. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still kind of always a little bit surprised too about that, even though I am an American and this is my country. <laughs> no, I absolutely agree. It is surprising. However, I would like to say that I am noticing at least in the last few years, a shift with yoga instructors. It's really interesting. There seems to be a bigger shift toward um, spirituality within our practice. And also, I mean, for instance, I have just finished teaching for, I think, the third time a course to yoga teacher train and a yoga teacher training course, Bhagavad Gita. So, you know, there is finally, I think that pendulum is swinging back to the other side where we're getting deeper into the roots of yoga and moving toward 
a spiritual path and understanding what yoga is truly about. You know, it's not about, it's not just exercise. I mean, of course, there will always be people in the West who practice it for those reasons. However, let me, let me add a caveat to that because what I also see and what I saw from the beginning is that oftentimes people will come to class thinking that they're coming to exercise but then after practicing for a little while, they get to a point where they realize there's something more to this. And then that's when they start to inquire. And it's the be- it's a beautiful opportunity for those of us who do teach from a spiritual perspective to really give them the teachings of yoga. So we're, we're getting there. We're trying to get there at least. <laughs> But thank you so much for bringing that up because yes, it is, it is very surprising that, um, I mean, because I think in most teacher training programs that people learn or, or, you know, the students learn about the yoga sutra. So you would think that there would be more training toward staying away from meats and alcohol and things like that, but we're getting there. I don't know how it is taught it other places, but my foundations are actually Shivananda yoga, where vegetarianism and, you know, no, ca- uh, well, let's put it this way, a sattvic diet is essential. And that's why one of the chapters in my book is all about sattvic diet and sattvic lifestyle. So those are my roots originally. But I think the way that I see it is Many people do their yoga teacher trainings on weekends where they live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they can still go home every day or drive, go to the drive through every day and pick up a burger and fries and their soda <laughs> or, you know, whatever they choose. And to me, my yoga teacher training was in Mexico. As I mentioned, it was an intensive And of course, it was all vegetarian. And of course, it was all non-alcoholic. I don't recall. I don't recall seeing any coffee there. I don't. I'm pretty sure that they didn't have coffee. That said, I don't know that it was sattvic diet. They probably may have used garlic and onions, which, you know, are not considered sattvic. But for those who don't know, there are many food products such as vinegar that are common. What we think of oftentimes as being healthy parts of a diet or, or mushrooms. Right. So we may think, oh, well, mushrooms and vinegar are healthy for us, but they are not considered sattvic. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You were another, um, of the benefits of yoga that I love that you talk about in your book that were elucidated by Dr. Satbir Singh Khalsa and, you know, postures, meditation, relaxation, and breathing. I really, really love that chapter because I felt very strongly about how important those things are in our society right now, you know, after the last several years of social and and political unrest. And then of course, COVID, you know, going through that pandemic was traumatic for so many people. And I have to say that personally, I'm having a problem with the fact that people seem to be trying to shift into moving on and not talking about it or not doing something about that trauma that they experience. We're just all kind of going on or pretending to go on with life. And I really, really appreciated that chapter with Dr. Khalsa speaking about PTSD and depression and how um, yoga is so beneficial to those kinds of conditions. And I wanted to mention that Dr. Khalsa, in my opinion, is the leading researcher in the world about yoga and the brain. Mm. He is a neuroscientist. He is also the research, I might have his title wrong, but he is in charge of research for the Yoga Alliance. 
And he is also the editor in chief of the journal for the International Association of Yoga Therapists. And he has been researching yoga and the brain almost all of his life. He is also affiliated with Harvard Medical School. The chapter title that focuses on Dr. Khalsa's teachings are yoga as an emotional lifesaver. And, you know, unfortunately, there are, you know, it, it used to be that there was a big stigma about mental health. And now I think our society is much more aware that we need to treat mental health as we treat nutrition and as we treat, you know, physical fitness. It is essential. And that chapter in particular focuses on yoga, the benefits of yoga for PTSD, anxiety, and depression. And just as an example, more than two in five adults within a seven-day period in the year 2021 experienced symptoms of an anxiety or a depressive disorder. The other thing is that you know, stress in the U.S. affects eight out of 10 Americans each week. Only 14% of American adults say they are very happy. And the other thing that I want to talk about is PTSD. Because what I talk about in my book, and I thought this was fascinating, I researched, the, I don't want to say the origins, but how I researched how our society recognizes PTSD. And the history of that is fascinating. And during World War I, there was one nomenclature for it. During World War II, there was another nomenclature for it. And they were all incorrect names, of course. So, um, for example, like soldier fatigue or whatever, for a long time, it was considered a military man's disease. And now we understand that women in particular are very strongly hit by PTSD. And of course, sexual abuse is just one instance that can trigger lifelong PTSD. But I had a, a great aunt who passed away a few years ago. She lived through World War II, were Jewish, and she lived in Lithuania during World War II. And so, you know, she experienced, you know, always the fear of the Russians and, you know, the, you know, and all the attacks and, you know, all the time. And she was a young girl. When she was in her later or latest years, she had dementia. And her daughter told me, that she would have nightmares every night about the Russians coming. So that must have been 70 years later, I don't know how many years, but the PTSD never left her. And what I talk about in the book through Dr. Kulsa's expert words and knowledge is that Oftentimes, of course, pills are not going to help for PTSD. You know, drugs are not going to help. They're just going to mask the problem. Talk therapy, which is, you know, the most common form of mental health, oftentimes re-triggers all of the painful moments. And that can be very difficult for the person. But with yoga, we don't have to worry about that. And what I mentioned in my book is with yoga, with a trauma-informed instructor or a certified yoga therapist who should be trauma-informed, because there are so many things, even within yoga, which can be considered triggers. And we have to be cognizant of the fact that we don't know when our students have PTSD. And of course, everyone responds differently. We don't know if they are afraid to be near a door or afraid to be near a wall. 
again, there are many different things that can cause those triggers. But Dr. Khalsa basically says that yoga is the best thing for PTSD. Yeah, I mean, that makes total sense, you know, the because of the way that the poses affect you on such a deep level that you're not even cognizant of it at the time. You know, some most people don't even realize what their practice, what they're doing in practice until the practice ends and they feel the difference in their minds and their bodies and their emotional state. It's I've had I've even had the experience as a student before of going into to a class feeling like, yeah, I, I feel pretty good. <laughs> and then by the time the class ends, I'm in tears. I'm in tears because I've released so much energy, so much that has been trapped within my body that I didn't that I didn't know was there. It can be a very somatic experience to take a yoga class. So yeah, yeah, that's really lovely that he has researched that and and put it in writing for for all of us to see. When you were speaking about releasing or dealing with PTSD, it was making me think of um, some of the practices that we do in shamanism to work with PTSD, which then led me to think about your chapter um, with Gloria Camarillo Vasquez yes. and yeah, Mother Earth and Native Ancestral Traditions. That was, I loved that chapter as well. It was beautiful. And I really connected with that because Again, as someone trained in shamanism, I I don't want to call myself a shaman, but someone trained in shamanism, what we do is deal directly with the earth and the energy of Pachamama, the energy of Mother Earth and how she helps us connect with a sense of being grounded and having uh, gratitude and connection to everything around us so that we don't, like you said in the beginning, take advantage of this planet that we live on. So yeah, thank you for um for that chapter. <laughs> That's another perfect example of how I see that as our society progresses, we go backwards. Mm. Because I think in prior generations, I do believe that everyone had their connections to mother nature in how in many different ways. But we've lost it. Many years ago, you know, I've been a yoga blogger for many, many years. And a long time ago, I wrote an article about living in cubes, meaning, you know, your cubicles and everything is sealed tight. And we, you know, you're on the 25th floor of an office building where you cannot literally open a window, you know, they're sealed shut. And you leave the office, it's already dark. You go to the office, it's dark. You don't step out of your office for anything. And we, you know, again, as a yoga teacher, we are taught that prana, the life force in the universe, is essential. And the same thing in terms of from uh, traditional Chinese medicine, the prana is the chi. And the, the concept behind traditional Chinese medicine is that chi or the prana has to flow through the meridians or the nadis. And one of the best ways is, of course, to be surrounded by the life energy outdoors, close to nature. Yes, yes. So thank you for sharing all of that, all of that. Um, I was also wondering about your experiences, again, because we started out talking about Native ancestral traditions, about some of your experiences in South America. Um, you had mentioned before herbalism, and I don't know if I told you that I'm also trained as an herbalist as well. So <laughs> tell us some of your experiences there. Well, first of all, I would like to say that my DNA does not show any indigenous um, connections. However, my daughter does have indigenous ancestry, but I, my DNA does not show it. However, I have always felt <laughs> um, a connection 
to Native American cultures and traditions. And uh, it has something that I've always felt resonated with me. And I lived on several occasions in Mexico and in South America. At one point living in South America, my daughter, she was a baby. She was maybe a year old and she seemed scrawny. She wasn't growing. And my best friend had this baby boy who was younger than her and he was huge. And my daughter was little <laughs> and my daughter didn't eat. And I would see this baby boy consuming more than what I would eat. <laughs> so we took my daughter to the head of the children's hospital and my husband wanted to go to that particular doctor. He felt that he had an excellent reputation and it wasn't a problem to get an appointment with the head of the children's hospital. And I was a little floored by, you know, here in the United States, the separation of allopathic medicine and anything that's holistic. And the diagnosis that this pediatrician gave was she has susto, S-U-S-T-O. That means fright, as in frightened, fearful. And it, it more means... Um, I, it's not about voodoo, but it's about it, for, for the way that I look at it is it's the energy is not aligned. Right. There's an imbalance in the energy and it has to be put back in place. And so, of course, I respected him because he was the head of the children's hospital. And I said, thank you very much for the diagnosis. Can you treat her? And he's like, no, I can't treat her. <laughs> I'm I'm a pediatrician, I'm a general practitioner, or, you know, an MD. He said, you have to go to an herbalist. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But I love how he told us we had to go to an herbalist. So we went to the marketplace and we found someone. And I've never been the kind of person that looked at it as, oh, that's crazy. I've always seen that plants heal mm -hmm. and that different traditions have healing benefits. And so we went to this woman in the marketplace and she, you know, did some, you know, I don't know, feathers and whatever that she rubbed around my daughter, but she prescribed several different things to us. And one of them was some kind of a green herb that we had to feed my, feed my daughter. Well, my modern brain told me, this is chlorophyll. This is good. It's coming from the earth. It's filled with prana. I have no idea what it was, but I knew by the color that it had to be good for her. The other thing that she had us do was bathe my baby in this, in I was going to say in the swimming pool, in the bathtub, <laughs> with certain kinds of herbs and flowers. Yes. And I mentioned that that is part of my Ayurvedic dinacharya that I take very long baths every night with essential oils. Oh, it's beautiful. the same concept. Mm -hmm. Again, I thought that that was just an amazing experience that the head of the children's hospital told us that that was what we needed to do. <laughs> and that would never happen in the United States. No, that would be very rare here. I remember when um, my daughter was a toddler and we were living on the West Coast. We were living in Santa Monica, California. And we were fortunate enough to have a pediatrician. I believe, what was his name? I think it was Jay Gordon, maybe. He wrote a column in one of the parenting magazines. And he was wonderful because he did offer homeopathic remedies. And that was so revolutionary to me. I could not believe because I would take him into her and he'd say, he'd look her over and he'd say, okay, this is what's going on. Do you want to deal with allopathic medicine or do you want to go the homeopathic route? 
And I'd always say the homeopathic route and he would prescribe and we would be on our way. And of course it always worked because homeopathy is magic. (laughs) It's beautiful, natural, energetic magic, just like herbalism. So yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Really love the story. That story. Another thing when I lived in South America while I was pregnant is I had a little bit of, it wasn't, you know, it was a little bit of upset stomach and the diagnosis, I did get the diagnosis and it was the bacterial flora in my intestines was offset. And, you know, I did not take any pills for it. I believe I took yogurt for it. You know, the acidophilus was all I needed to get it back in check. But the doctors, my doctor did tell me, do not drink. I was vegetarian, but I consumed dairy. And he said, do not drink any milk. So he said, you know, the yogurt for the acidophilus is fine, but avoid all dairy. And then when my daughter was also still young and in South America, the pediatrician also said, do not give her any dairy products. Again, it's just a very different mindset from our Western medicine in the United States. Exactly. Exactly. It is very different than um, what most, maybe the average American is taught and conditioned to believe about drinking milk. But the other wonderful thing is now we have this ever-growing vegan movement, which is phenomenal in so many respects, because even for autoimmune conditions, it's been it's been proven that things like dairy and gluten are the two biggest agitators of autoimmune conditions. So yeah, there's something something very valuable in what you just said in avoiding dairy for many people, maybe not for everyone. So the other chapter I really loved in your book, actually, I was mentioning it to my daughter about um, laughter yoga. And when I told her about that chapter, she got very excited. She was like, oh, I want to hear more about that. (laughs) So would you please tell us about our laughter yoga? Sure. And I am a a laughter yoga um, coach. I did my training. Laughter yoga was created by Dr. Madan Kataria. So he is an MD from India. And his wife happens to be a yoga teacher. And he understood the benefits from a medical perspective of laughter. And his wife understood the benefits of pranayama. So he combined different elements of laughter with pranayama. And that is laughter yoga. And um, and again, I do lead laughter yoga. However, the concept in my book is based on one of my mentors from South America. His story to me is, oh my God, it was just incredible. I knew him when I lived in South America. His office was above my business. And he was just a normal businessman. He would come to to my cafe. I owned a cafe. He would come to my cafe for his coffee and dessert every day. Sometimes he would have lunch there. Again, he was just a normal guy. And then I don't remember how many years later I was living in Miami. I turn on the news and he had a very unusual name. And I turn on the news and I see that a man with this very unusual name is running for vice president of the country. However, the man was wheelchair bound and he was paraplegic. It turns out that in the period of time after I left the country and before I turned on the TV and saw him on the news, he was a victim of an assault and he was shot you know, a bullet lodged in his spinal cord. So he was not only left paraplegic, but he was left in excruciating pain. For four years, he was primarily bedridden, taking every kind of painkiller imaginable. I believe they tried all different kinds of medical treatments, um, interventions, nothing worked. And then he heard I believe about Norman Cousins and Norman Cousins experience. 
And as a result, he got into laughter as therapy. He ended up writing maybe eight or 10 books himself on laughter as medicine. And he became friends with Patch Adams. And he was an amazing spokesperson for the benefits of laughter as medicine. Anyway, he did win the elections. He became vice president. And then he was named by Ban Ki-moon to, he was given a position in Geneva on behalf of handicapped people all over the world. And then he returned to South America and he became president of the nation. And I recognize none of that would have happened if he was on opioids or, or whatever else. It was because he found the solace and the strength through laughter. So to wow. me, that is one of the most hard hitting of my chapters. And of course, it is so easy to laugh. Of course, all everything, all the tips in my book, every one of my chapters has five easy tips. And then every chapter has a give it a try section. And all the tips and the give it a tries are free with the exception of, you know, get your diagnosis and get your green light from your medical practitioner. And everything can be done in as little as 10 minutes a day. One of the things that I do every day that is mentioned in the last chapter of my book is a gratitude journal. It takes me one minute every day to write three things that I'm grateful for. But that one minute has such an, a, an incredible impact in my life. Absolutely. I agree. I haven't done my gratitude journal in a while, but it's interesting. I also wrote, I would do it before bedtime every night, three things. I chose three things for my gratitude journal. And I found that on those nights I slept more soundly or I would have more um, vivid dreams and I would wake up feeling much better. Thank you for reminding me of that. I'm going to have to get back to writing. I, it's been such a long time since I've written in my gratitude journal. It was such, yeah, such an important experience to do that. Well, thank you for sharing because I usually do it when I wake up and now I want, sometimes I do it at night, but now I think I'm going to try doing it right before I go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. I always felt like it helped me clear my mind of anything that was going on in my mind at bedtime, you know, it just allowed me to just let go and sleep well. So yeah, may, you try it in the evenings. Maybe I'll start trying it in the morning and see what happens. <laughs> but speaking of which, one of the pranayam breathing techniques that I do every day, and I try to do it early in the morning, is Brahmari, bumblebee breath. Mm -hmm. And I was always told that bumblebee breath helps to give you positivity Yes. And to ease a little bit of depression. And so that's why I was taught to do it first thing in the morning so that you have a bright, positive start to your day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was taught the same way. And I actually had a private student who I taught Bumblebee Breck to. And he told me he couldn't do it because he had a dog. And every time he sat down to do it, the dog would go crazy. <laughs> He's like, I'm so sorry. I, you know, he was grateful that I taught him how to do it, but he said he couldn't practice it because it drove his dog crazy. He'd be all over. I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> that is funny. So I also want to get to probably one of the most touching chapters of your book, um, your experience with Randall and Christian, Kristen Brooks, the most touching chapter to me because it talks about bhakti. And as all of my listeners know, I'm a practicing bhakta. Bhakti is so very important and dear to my life. And, and I really love the way you described how Randall and Kristen Brooks describe the way that bhakti affects them and the practice and looking at it on, on different levels. So would you please, we're running out of time, but would you please just share a little bit about them and well, your experience wanna, with them? 
what I wanted to mention is that every one of my chapters gives clinical studies or research findings to support all of the statements. And so that chapter does have multiple entries. But if I can, I would love to go back and read just something from my childhood, from when I first felt the magic of bhakti. Mm, please do. <laughs> Sunday mornings, while everyone else at my house was still asleep, I would head down to the family room. Perched on top of a red and white checkered tablecloth was our only television. It was a black and white set with a rabbit ear antennae and a dial to select between only five channels with programming. During church time, the Queen of Gospel, Mahalia Jackson, sang a few feet away from me through that bulky console. Her voice and inner fire were captivating. The power and devotion in her songs of praise were nothing like the squawking band or dishwatery chorus classes at my predominantly white elementary school. Even better than listening to Mahalia on the tube was singing with my older sister in our living room to an invisible audience on our green low pile carpeted floor. And that just kind of gives an introduction to how I felt, you know, I have done many different introspective exercises throughout my life. And in one of them, those images and those recollections popped up as being something that was so important in my life. And again, it was devotional music. Yes. Kirtan, devotional music, chanting, all of that touches you on such a very deep level. I've been to kirtans on the street, for instance, in New York City on Union Square, and just sitting there and singing and watching people go by, you can see how that music is touching them, and especially children. They're, they're still so fresh and open and innocent, and that music just enters their hearts and you see it on their faces, the sense of wonder or the sense of joy that they experience from hearing devotional music. Well, I wanted to mention that, again, children are less inhibited and several of the concepts in my book talk about how we need to embrace our inner child because when we become adults, we are uncomfortable laughing. We are told to be serious or we don't want to sing in front of other people because we are told we can't carry a tune. My mother, who you now know all about, my mother always said she couldn't carry a tune. Yet to me, one of the most precious times of every day was at bedtime when she would sing to me out of tune in my bed to help me go to sleep. And of course, it's just all about coming from the heart. It has nothing to do with your pitch. <laughs> I mean, it would be nice if we could all sing like Mariah Carey, but it really doesn't matter. It's about what comes from the soul. And so many whether they're pop artists or whether they're kirtanias, many of them who I find the most invigorating do not necessarily have that perfect voice, but there's something about them. It's the charisma. It's what comes from the heart. Yes, I agree. I agree. That's the, because anything that comes from the heart is going to have a greater effect on others. It's going to connect with other people. I was just going to say um, the other thing I just wanted to mention about the Brooks and singing is I share an incredible challenge in their life. And music was an incredible message for them as well. And every chapter in my book, for the most part, I try to uncover some of the life challenges of my mentors because we all go through challenges. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. And again, that's what I loved about your book, that these lessons are coming from real people who are have lived through many things in life. That's what makes it wisdom because it's realized, it's actualized. 
not only that, you're you're giving that wisdom that they're sharing, and then you break it down into practical little nuggets so that the reader can really learn from, from what they're reading. They're not just enjoying it or reading a story. They're actually learning something. And then you finish it off with five tips that just, it's just so powerful. <laughs> and it's such a helpful tool, I think, for anyone who reads it. So anyone, everyone actually who's listening to this podcast, please do yourself a favor. Check out this book. It's called, once again, From the Boxing Ring to the Ashram. And our beautiful authoress is Deborah Charnes. And Deborah, please tell us how we can, how the listeners can get their hands on your book. Well, of course, the easiest way is to go to my website, Deborah, D-E-B-O-R-A-H, Charnes, C-H-A-R-N-E-S dot com slash book. And you will also be able to read a lot, well, not a lot, but a number of the testimonials, the endorsers of my book, the ones that several of the ones that are on my website are actually from medical practitioners. So I was really pleased to get uh, a lot of endorsements from people in the medical community. You can read some of those. You can read more about the book, more about me. And of course, there are links to buying on different sources. And one of them is a link to buy at a discount if you buy more than 10. So um, the um, I did get an endorsement from several people high up in the yoga world and in the yoga therapy business and world. And what one of them says is that it should be essential reading for all yoga teachers, all yoga therapists, and even anyone working in the medical community. So again, to me, there is a reason why people should be buying multiple sets. So again, 10, so, you know, for, um, of course, more than 10, but in terms of for teams. Yes, yes. And also listeners, please remember that I will put links that Deborah mentioned in the show notes. So you don't have to remember what they are. I will put them in the show notes for you. Well, thank you, Deborah, for being with us today. It's been so lovely to take this time to talk to you and hear more about this exciting book. I can't wait to get a hard copy of it. <laughs> and I can't wait. I've already been thinking of some of the chapters of sharing it in my yoga classes with my students. So I am grateful for everything that you have put together in this text. I'm grateful for you being on the show and I love your energy. I love all of the knowledge you've been imparting to us today. And I hope to have you back on again, because I have a feeling that you will be bringing more wisdom and knowledge through your writing to not just my listeners, but all of us in the yoga world. My next book will be about the 11th Kanto. <laughs> there you go. That's perfect. Well, thanks again, Deborah. Thank you. It has been a true joy to be here with you. Thank you so much for listening to this show. I hope you found something useful. Like everything in life, we can take what we need and leave the rest. Please feel free to contact me with comments or questions at womanonherpath at gmail.com.